everyone, and welcome to Talk Together. Thank you for joining us for an evening of talking about Dungeons and Dragons. I am Rebecca Hare. I will be your host tonight, and I will be chatting to the fantastic Ed Cartwright, who you Hello. can see here. Um, so first things first, Ed, mm. I'm sure anyone who has ever watched a stream knows and loves you, but for those few poor people who haven't, do you want to <laughs> introduce yourself and tell us a bit about yourself? Okay, uh, my name is uh, Edward Cartwright. I'm an actor um, and uh, I live on a boat, which is what you can see around me. Um, and uh, what else? Uh, <laughs> I, I don't, I, I, like, I, I'm having a very fun time. I'm living my best life, I guess. Um, and this very much includes playing uh, Dungeons and Dragons. Oh yeah, that was, uh, I think, what I would say. Um, so I have been playing, uh, this sounds appallingly hipster, but I have been playing Dungeons and Dragons on and off for the past 25 years. And I love the fact that it's only in the last sort of five years that it's come to the um, thing of now it can be like an opening line in a bar. As you say, I play Dungeons and Dragons. Do you play Dungeons and Dragons? Whereas previously that would have got you ostracized. And uh, now that's all changed around a bit. And the fact that I get to play it on the net is basically the best thing in the world. It is impossibly cool that we get to do this it's, and call it like it's not quite fun. a job but it's no, awesome no, no, no. A, a, yeah um, a remunerative hobby that's great yeah it's brilliant so this evening for the next hour or so we'll be going through some questions some anecdotes probably knowing us quite a lot of tangents yes, um and as for the questions that i ask i don't get to pick them the <laughs> dice will decide which is the best possible way Absolutely. however before we kick off, just a little bit of admin. Uh, as I said, we'll run for an hour or thereabouts. Uh, we are delighted to be sponsored by Hero Forge, Ultra Pro and Elderwood Academy, and also to be supported by D&D Beyond, Warriors of Waterdeep and Level Up Dice. Uh, we are Roll Together RPG on all social media. And as always, a huge thank you to our wonderful D20 Club on Patreon. Um, check them out, join the Dice Heads. They are the nicest people. Yes. Uh, our shows are available as pod podcasts. Just search Roll Together RPG on your favorite podcasting app. We should be there. Should be there. Um, and just one little note, this is going to be the last talk together, don't panic, just the last talk together <laughs> on a Saturday. From next week, we're on at the same time, so 6 p.m. BST on a Friday night. So we're just shifting from a Saturday night to a Friday night, but everything else should feel very much the same. Ed, shall we just jump straight in and roll the day? Yes, let's do that. Let's see what okay. we uh, I don't have the aplomb. Of some of our other hosts, so I don't feel, I feel quite up to the game show chanting. However, <laughs> no, no, don't do that. That is, oh, what a great question to start with. That is a three. Okay. Ed, what Go. is your favorite character class? Oh, okay, this is really difficult. So, <laughs> first of all, I haven't played all of the character classes, um, which I feel like is an oversight because the thing is, for a long time, I would only be um, uh, a tank. Well, not a tank, but kind of like a fighty person because um, I felt like. Um, Oh, how do you put it? I didn't get it. Like, so a lot of the, because we were younger, um, a lot of the people who I was playing D&D campaigns with, we wouldn't get that deep into them because either we'd get bored or we wouldn't meet up enough. And therefore, the um, because we only had early level characters, any early level um, spellcast was always very squishy, which um, is a shame because uh, they're the ones that are the most likely to get killed then if you do something stupid. I was prone to doing stupid things in my early D&D &D, um uh, escapades and therefore if I was something that was a tank then it was more fun because then I would be the one rushing and bashing <laughs> stuff and um, it just felt like it made more sense to me however my favourite um, character that I've played so far I think has probably been uh, my bard character Viorica um, <laughs> I have uh, yes uh, I think um, yes because I've I've played a, a whole campaign with you uh, as yes you have, and that was Viorica so much fun. is beautiful in so yeah, many well, ways. Th well, this is the thing, but also I was told when I created Viorica, um, we don't necessarily want someone who will be adventurer uh, savvy, ne definitely nothing overpowered. And mm -hmm. I created Viorica as a kind of um, innocent abroad in the Dungeons and Dragons world, which actually worked very, very well. Not in the campaign that you and I played, because by then uh, he's become much more of an, an actual adventurer. Mm -hmm. And I think that worked. But um, so, I think the problem is that rather than pick a class and then create a character in that class, I create a character and then pick the class that I think that they'd most suit. Oh, that's really cool. Okay. You see what I mean? I think, well, yeah, because um, 
Yeah, because I think that, that if you're going to create a character, then creating a bard or a warrior or a wizard is slightly... Um, you don't create as well-rounded a character then. Mm. Because I think that what, what, what you want to get from um, your character is a reason why they are what they are, not that they are what they are and that's their reason for being. Do you see what I mean? It's, it's yes. slightly the other way around. Um, but in just in terms of what I think the coolest one is, probably Monk. Because I like the key points and I like the whole um, de deflecting and stuff. I, also, yeah. the thing is, I've never seen a monk at any level higher than like six, I think. So I don't know what they can do. I got to play, I think Persephone went up to level 12 in um, Gloom Falls on Baldur's Gate. Oh, it and it's just, how dare you? <laughs> <laughs> no, it was so much fun. But yeah, can confirm that if you want those like kick ass, I just, you know, climbed a hundred feet in the air and then <laughs> killed a monster with my bare hands, like yeah. moments. Monks are so good for that. Awesome. Well, okay, but also the thing is though, and um, this is a uh, <laughs> the small tangent, which I think we're which I think we're allowed. Um, I Go think on, that um, uh, creating a character to be a character that already exists, for instance, Yoda. Uh, or something like that. If you're like, I want to, because um, one of the um, earliest characters I created with uh, Chris, who is um, the doyen of all to, uh, for all together, hmm. uh, I created a gnome um, gunslinger, and realized it was really cool. But we then realized halfway through the first session of the campaign, it's like, okay, you created Batman, which is fine, <laughs> but I don't want to play Batman. I wanted to play my character and. Hmm. Um, actually, what that led on to, because that was a uh, a campaign. Uh, what's it called? Something to, something about the Underdark. Um, oh, I can't remember what the thing was called. But basically, there were a load of big spiders, and um, this gunslinger character got trapped by the spiders and um, committed suicide in a very very beautiful way. I understand that sounds weird. Oh no! You talked a bit about this campaign. Last time it sounded right. spectacularly weird but brilliant. Well, that's what I mean. But the thing is, what it what it meant that I got to do is play. Um, Your gelatinous that, cube. Yes, the uh, glabagool. Now that really was. I I wouldn't say like I wouldn't say it was my favourite just because it was so mental, but it was a lot of fun to do. And that's what I mean. It was the the um, that's the kind of way that I really because rather than playing Batman, therefore I got to play a thing that I couldn't even have imagined, and I mm. would prefer it that way around. So not playing Batman, but playing the thing that I couldn't. Yes. Imagine. I find it bizarre. I never intentionally build a character around mm. someone who exists, but then mm. I can look back and go, oops. So do you know Firefly? <laughs> yes, very well, exactly. I have a bard and she's in a home game and I love her. She has lots of sharp edges and is quite complicated and she makes yeah. me very happy. Yeah. Um, and I thought I'd pulled her straight out of my head and she's brilliant and wonderful and completely unique. And then someone pointed out, did you combine Inara, the, <laughs> you know, the, yes. S, the courtesan and Zoe, the um, incredibly kick-ass fighting right. second in command to make mirror your bard, and I went, uh oh. <laughs> well, Oops. that uh, no, no, no. But hang on, <laughs> because I think that because um, I agree with that because it might well have been the case. But the thing is that um, in order to identify somebody, people look for things that they already know. If mm. you see what I mean. So I think that you could easily have brought that up, but only combined two things which are two of your favorite characteristics. I would therefore say that that is not plagiarism per se, <laughs> but just enjoying the thing that you can, because um, like combining those two characters would be amazing. And if you call- She's a lot of fun. If you call her Aria Zoe, <laughs> then, then it would be a bit of a thing. But because you created a thing yourself, I think that works. And also the thing is um, like D&D is, awful for um, recreating uh, stereotypes. And mm. that's what I mean. I think that I wouldn't want to play as a stereotype because I think it'd be boring. And therefore combining two characters, I think isn't quite. Yeah. Uh, it's changing the thing around. You are wise. I think also not to get <laughs> not to get too feminist, but this was one of my earlier characters when I was still sort of looking around the fantasy universe for people oh. to kind of there weren't, you know, it's getting a lot better now, but yeah. there are a lot fewer female archetypes if you want to play a definitely female character. Absolutely. Um guys get a lot easier. Um I agree. whereas now I'm, you know, several years more experienced. 
and we'll just pull a character that I think is fun without having to look at archetypes and stereotypes. But at the start, I was going, but I don't, what in the triangle of like cute, kick-ass, sexy, where do I want to be? <laughs> do I want to be a Mary Sue? Like, no, you don't. Yes. There needs to be a more rounded character thing. With yeah, no, I agree. And also I think that that's um, experience, uh, as you talk about, is really, really important because um, I know I talked about this in the last one as well, but when I um, came into a proper game, with Chris for the first mm -hmm. time, it was what were we playing. It was another like uh, pre-created uh, campaign, I think. But I was, I know, <laughs> no, it wasn't at all pre-created. We were playing gods from uh, any pantheon you wanted, but it, the idea was that it was a, a, a place where um, uh, the gods had disappeared, but were then coming back because they started Ooh. dying. And so it was a really, really cool idea, and I got to play Odin because. Chris was, Chris was like, you've played this before and a lot of other people completely haven't played this. So why don't you play Odin? We'll give you guidance and it means that you can help out. And I was playing so much worse than everybody else. Everyone really <laughs> got the idea and I was like, no, no, but we must conserve our spells. It was really, um, I mean, it was good. But the thing was that it made me realize that um, like historic experience, having just played it for a long time, did not mean I was any good. Which was a shame to find out, having played it for 15 years at that stage already. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like, oh, no. Um, but yeah, no, I think that, because that's what I mean. Experience, I think, doesn't mean just having played it for a long time, but it means playing lots of different characters and getting yourself into as many situations which are unusual, even by D&D &D standards, I think, mm -hmm. which relies on um, good other players and, good, and a good DM. Yeah, say. for sure. Yes, you can never quite... It doesn't matter what character you have in your head if you can't play at a table with other people. That is exactly the, exactly the thing. Shall we roll the dice again? Yes, let's see what happens. We've got through <laughs> one whole question. I feel we're doing well. <laughs> oh, oh, I found this one really difficult when I had to answer it. This is a seven. Mm -hmm. So this is, is there a moment in a TTRPG that impacted your life out of game? Oh, Lord. I mean, yes, dozens. Um, but are they coherent? Um, because, okay, I don't sort of try and live my life the way that D&D &D characters would live their lives, because that Reasonable. would be insane. We like staying alive. A little bit, and Ooh. also, yeah, exactly, and just, just trying to hoard gold. I mean, I guess we technically do that, but, like, anyway. But, the, so, um, the... Hmm. I think that if if I was going to pick one, it would be any of the deaths of my characters because um, I feel those pretty hard, which is good, um, but it's not very nice if you see what I mean. As in like, it's not something you want to go through each time, but I think it's vital if you're going to play a character properly that the stakes are high enough that if they do die, then it really matters. And so, um, just to get slightly morbid for a second, I've been to far more funerals than the average bear, apparently. And um, for a long time, I um, stopped myself feeling at them, if you see what I mean. It was, I think it was that it's kind of in my family and stuff like it's not sort of good to uh, cry at funerals and stuff like that. Not because it's a bad thing to do, but more because it's like it's upsetting for everybody else. Mm. So big sort of overt displays of defection were not encouraged. And um, so it's only been later in my life when I've actually been able to process and start grieving for somebody when I've gone to their funeral. And I think it's slightly the same thing with characters. It starts off and you just want to make the biggest and baddest and most terrifying character ever. And they tend to be a stereotype, which means that when they die, they're kind of like, oh, I want to build another one now. Um, it's just going to be annoying to have to get it to that sort of level of power again. But then when you actually start creating characters which uh, you are interested in and which actually matter to the story and to the story matters to them then all of a sudden if they do die then it can become a thing of I'm never going to play with that character again in a, in both ways as in like uh, playing with them as in playing the role playing game but playing with them as in going I don't know what you're going to do I would, I would love to find out what the rest of your story is going to be and that's that's the that's the thing that makes me because the writers like um Tolstoy, uh, the famous Russian fella, his great thing used to be like, I love all my characters and I'm really interested what they 
what they end up doing in the next session of writing that I'm doing. Now, of course, he has control of the writing, so normally he gets to control what they do. But I love somebody who can give their characters free reign enough, and I think this is really important for a character in D&D, give them free reign enough, that you really don't know what's going to happen. And I think that's kind of the most important thing. And I think that um, it has allowed me to process loss better by losing characters. It's kind of the, in the same way as I would say that d d is fantastic, like first stage therapy. Hmm. I would not say do not replace it with, do not replace therapy with D&D, that doesn't work. But at the same time, you can put yourself and, or like a version of yourself, your character, in a position and as it were, play out um, uh, a thing that, you, that you're that you scared of in real life or that worries you in real life or something like that. And it allows you to at least give yourself a thing of like, oh, that wasn't as scary as I thought it was gonna be. Because often fear is scarier than the actual thing that you're afraid of and all of that kind of stuff so from that point of view i would say it allows you to um it allows you to go through experiences that a that you wouldn't usually go through like at all in your real life unless you're quite a psychopath um but also that means that you can uh, go through stuff and see that it's not potentially as bad as you thought it was i have to ask because we are both actors mm. do you find a similar experience when playing a character on stage, one hundred percent, one hundred percent. Does it change though when you've created the character and you are improvising every second? Oh, oh, that's a very good question. Thank you. Um, <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. So, hmm. yeah, because he, your character has to be the way that you've rehearsed it, kind mm. of. I mean, obviously, there's there's room for maneuver on stage, but if you do too much room for maneuver, then the director's going to come up to you and go, "What the hell was that?" Um, However, there is an oppressiveness to a character when you're on stage in as much as if it's, mm, okay. Yeah, there is an oppressiveness. Okay, there's an oppressiveness if you're playing a Shakespearean character. If you're playing a character who's never been played before, then obviously you get to do whatever you want and that is kind of more interesting. But a really, really good character like, um, uh, uh, not Evelyn War, what's his name? Oscar Wilde, like an Oscar Wilde character or a Shakespearean character, there's a certain duty of care that you have, I think, with those yeah. characters, as in like, this had better be good. And good doesn't mean different. Good can mean just doing it the way that you want to, if you see what I mean. But I think that um, your own character is so much more yours than almost any character, even one that you've written for yourself um, can be. Then I think, and also, also like there's, there's a cliche which is that every D and D character you make is some form of you. I don't think that that's necessarily true, but I do mm -hmm. think that you get the sense of it being you much more, and it's much easier to make decisions as a character in D and D than it is as a make decisions as a character on stage. I mm. would say. But yes, very good question. Very good. Why? Thank you. Should we have another one? Yes. Okay. Let's do that. Uh, do do be do be do. I'm using my lovely level up die, and it nice. is making the nicest clonk sound clonk. ever. Yeah, exactly. I have people who know my usual luck will be astounded. I have rolled in that one. No, oh! but it's a really good question. Um, okay. Ed, what is your most epic character moment? <laughs> I feel you have a whole wealth to choose from. <laughs> so have fun picking just one. Oh yeah, no, this is okay. So there's several things. I, I presume I talked a bit about how um, someone gave me a, someone gave me one of the biggest compliments I've ever had, which was when uh, they were playing with Glabagool. They said, "Good God, Ed, the thing that playing um, with you and Glabagool, it's like having a philosophy lecture every single gaming session." That was really cool. I can't um, work out if I'd be complimented or offended by that. I just oh no, I was I was hugely. <laughs> I'm complimented. glad you were really. Yeah. I know I was definitely very very complimented, but the um, the other. Uh, I mean, because to be honest, <laughs> basically, uh, Glabagool uh, had three other characters inside them at the time and then got like, I'm not going to say that. I was going to say something I shouldn't have said, but then got abs like smacked by uh, the Demogorgon um, and like fired hundreds of feet over the other side of the battlefield, yet survived. And because um, they survived, all of the characters that were inside them survived as well. That's that cool. was amazing. That's so cool. However, I do have to say that completely unexpectedly, I mean, I, th I thought it was going to be effective, but I didn't realize it was going to be that effective, was when Viorica, um 
cast I can't remember what the spell was. But we managed to fool the the um the beardy the the crow beard person completely. Oh my goodness, yes. That was I'd amazing. I've forgotten that. Oh. And it was just it was a proper thing of like okay, well the campaign just ended because they just <laughs> the, the, um, the the big bad just buggered off. Was it a major fool. image? It was something like that. Exactly. Basically, I fooled them into thinking that I'd broken the thing that they were searching for, and so then they just left. Yes. Which was perfect. For people who haven't seen Seek Spell yes. Terrell Buried, this is a campaign that Ed and I both played, and it is still one of my favourites, DM'd by lovely. the exceptional yeah. George Lockett. Um, and it was the penultimate episode. We were in the final bit of the dungeon. We had yeah, so finally defeated the enormous plant monster guardian <laughs> thing that was guarding this huge artefact that we needed to save the world. Exactly. And then the person we thought was Big Bad, who actually was second to the Big Bad who popped up in the final episode, yes. turned up and was like, ha thank you for defeating the monster. Now give me the artefact. <laughs> and we we're all like, oh, we're tapped. We're exhausted. We're injured. There's nothing to do. Yeah, oh, no. And then yeah. Ed's magnificent bard, Fiorica, who, is it fair to say, comes across as quite unassuming? Very much so. I mean, a, a diva of the, of the worst oh, of kind. But at the same time, yes. No, not, not one who you think is going to take the, the um, campaign by the scruff of the neck. Certainly not. It was a party full of strong personalities. Mm -hmm. It was amazing. <laughs> And yeah, Fiorica stepped forward and cast. I want to say it was something like Major Image. And yeah, you made Crowbeard believe that you'd broken this artifact. And he just turned around and walked home, right? He was like, oh, well, screw you then. Well, but, but which completely made sense because the thing was that they had traveled. I mean, he? I can't remember what the thing Don't was. Remember. But um, he w it had traveled, I mean, miles and miles. And then it looked like everything, we just brought everything down. It was, it was, all, uh, it was all bad. And that's why I think, because. Um, that was defeat without bloodshed as well, which feels like a very big thing because like killing stuff and destroying stuff is all well and good and it's extremely good fun, but it feels much more impressive. And that's why I think this is my favorite character moment. It feels much more impressive to be able to do something and then for everyone to go, wait, what just happened? Hmm. As opposed to a sort of grinding, like I'm just going to bash this thing to death with a spoon, you know, it sort of doesn't... <laughs> <laughs> but spoons are fun. Oh, no, absolutely. But what I mean is, it's just if it takes two sessions and it's just like, oh, God, I just got to keep killing yeah. him. I haven't got any spells left. Then after a while, that becomes a little bit depressing. Whereas when you just do something surprising and wonderful. Okay. Sorry, I'm yeah. being bashed about a bit in my boat. Ooh, are you it's all fine. right? Yes, no, it's fine. <laughs> ah, the perks and the downsides of living <laughs> on a boat. Yes. I also think, I'm, I mean, Viorica is obviously the character I have played with, so the one mm. I have of yours closest to my heart. But Viorica was particularly brilliant at maybe not epic, but spectacularly beautiful character moments. Oh, um, man. And, that, oh. yeah, that was that was amazing. Because also it was the thing that I saved that one up for such a long time because I've been wanting to say it for ages. Because, um, sorry, again, for slight uh, background thing, your character at the end of Buried wasn't allowed to go home, which was heartbreaking. But then, I'm, I'm well, that's, <laughs> but that's what I mean. And it's the, the thing that then I suddenly thought, well, hang on, this is two characters who don't have homes because in a previous campaign, um, the Oracles burnt down and therefore they were both just lost people. And there is something so romantic about lost souls because if you can find a way to have a home, which isn't, because I don't know if it's an English thing, but there's very much a sort of bricks and mortar thing about mm. A home and then uh, 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 a home is a home is your castle and all of that kind of stuff but i don't believe that's true at all particularly not as i live on a boat because it seems to be a completely separate thing because i i now never have to move house again except literally hmm. which is quite nice because it means that wherever i am will just be home yeah. and that was kind of the effect that i was doing with um uh with yorica and and uh, and your character was it was the the thing of i thought well home doesn't need to be a, a specific place and therefore, if you can find a way of making wherever you are home, then that's a really lovely, uh, like, idea. And also means that you're never, you're never far away from home, which is lovely. Yeah, completely. Oh, you've made me have feelings. Oh. There is a really soppy Billy Joel song that is one of my favourite songs ever. It's called You're My Home. And it's exactly that idea that I could go anywhere, live anywhere. It doesn't matter as long as I'm with you. You are my home. Deeply, deeply soppy, but it's just a yeah, a lovely thing that D and D can capture beautifully. All the found family tropes can have truth in them. Exactly, and that's what I mean because that's the thing. Uh, D and D has this reputation as very much like swords and sandals and like 
dungeon grinding and bashing people up and stuff like that, but it became incredibly beautiful. It does help if you have actors playing, but it's completely not necessary. And actually, I think the best um, group combination is if you have a couple of theatrical people, they don't actually need to be actors, but people who are big, because then they can be the ones who take on the, uh, what do you call it? Like the meat and potatoes of getting the thing going, because <laughs> it's a good imagination thing. But then if you have somebody who's quiet and sits and just thinks about what everybody's saying, then they can come out with the most beautiful and really unexpected things. I'm thinking um, specifically of uh, Emma, mm. um, Chris's uh, other half, who is, uh, I've I've only been DM'd by her once, and unfortunately we had to curtail the campaign. But M's long range um, DMing is the best I've ever heard of. The way that Chris describes it, the the Easter eggs that get put in there mm. and stuff like that, and that's what I mean. I think it's just being showy and sort of theatrical is very is is one thing, but the yin to that yang is very much the thing of sitting and thinking and being quiet, which I think is very very impressive. Absolutely. I have uh, the game where I have my uh, Firefly Bard mirror. Um, we play, there's a couple of us are actors. We're all mm. theatre adjacent. Um, mm -hmm. So actors, a director, and then one of us is a writer. And mm -hmm. uh, he is wonderful just as a human being and as a player, but he'd never played D&D &D before and really didn't want to do the role play of, I actually speak the words of my character. Oh, wow. So struggled for a little bit. He found this most beautiful way of doing it, which was narrating essentially oh, what, yeah. um, she's called Dex, his character. She's a rogue, she's amazing. Awesome. Um, what she says and does. And it is just as impactful, if not more, as an actor going and giving it because yeah, 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 yeah. there's all that nuance and all that creativity and you get all of the description around it. Yeah, so cool. playing with actors is great fun, but yeah, I would hate to only ever play with actors because you lose I think, yeah. all the beauty of what other people can bring. Exactly, and also then it just becomes a thing of competing egos and that is not a way to run a D&D &D yeah. game. Like that doesn't work, exactly. Um, I, but I'm not even going to roll the dice again because I need to ask you, Ooh. you've told me so many epic character moments, but I want to know what is the most epic moment that your Warriors of Waterdeep character has had so far? And I would like you to tell me their full name, please. Oh, this is really unfair. <laughs> this is such a thing. Okay. My character, okay, hang on. My character's full name is, <laughs> I can't even do it. Okay, is Halvanet. Salada, no, damn it! Salada, no, no. So I can't. For some reason, this is a thing that I thought was just a funny thing, in which I I played with a couple of times, and now I really can't say it. It's really annoying. Halvanet Salada, no. Anyway, I yes. think that was beautiful. Thank you. And it made me giggle. I'm very sorry. <laughs> it's fine. Anyway, the definitely uh, my my favourite um, thing that uh, that they've done. Um, oh, hang on. There's some other bits as well. Them discovering that how to have fun again was great, and I feel like that was exemplified. <laughs> I feel like that was exemplified when uh, they cast a massive um, guiding bolt mm. on the wall and blasted through it, and then made it all uh, um, rainbow colours. Mm. And went, now that's fabulous. And that was one of the one of my favourite pieces of improvisation I've ever done in my life. Because <laughs> it was just, I thought, well, hang on, I can make it colours. It's a whole wall. It's kind of a square. This is totally happening. And then it became a thing, which was really, really nice. Because, um, yes, so to just to be clear, I am, uh, I hope, a huge uh, ally of the um, LBGTQA plus uh, community, although I am not. In fact, to be honest, uh, if you were... If you're going to be harsh about it, I do not have a single minority, like, atom in my body, which is a shame, but therefore means that I do need to uh, work hard to be uh, an ally and also to um, try and be empathetic to, to those who do have um, issues with these kind of things, if you see what I mean, because it's really, really tough seeing it because... I have to sit there sort of going, okay, I I just can't imagine what this is like to go through. Mm. And therefore anything that I can do, this is why this is why it was so pleasing for me because um, part of the thing with Warriors of Waterdeep is uh, the idea was to not be a uh, gender that you're, that, that you are, mm. if you see what I mean, your character isn't the same. And I've nearly always played male characters, um, partly because it's easier, but also because uh, I didn't, how do you put it? 
I felt like I wasn't going to be, um, I didn't have enough experience of playing a gender other than my own to, to mm -hmm. do, to allow the characters to develop as much as I, I wanted them to. Um, I've now played lots of female characters and uh, non-gender characters and stuff like that. So therefore, now I feel like I'm perfectly happy with it. But it was a big deal for me taking it on to begin yeah, with. And it's been a real, it's been a real uh, positive experience. I have to confess, the only time, and I mean the only time I've ever played a character who's not deliberately female, mm. is when I want to play someone who's particularly a masculine pompous ass. <laughs> yes, and it. it's, it's very, very easy to play those those people because yeah. we have met we've all met them and they're very very annoying and that's i think exactly the thing um but never for longer than a four shot is i think the yeah. longest one shots or four parties i i have no interest in playing pompous ass for longer than four episodes oh my god well it's also because um this was the thing with viorica because viorica uh the character it was never that explicit i don't think but the idea was that they were um uh castrated a castrati because i really wanted to play that thing of they felt like they were male but everything that's in the stereotype of making somebody male it was taken away mm -hmm. and therefore how does that work in a very because the D, D world can be a very hyper masculine world yes. in as much as might is right and strength is the thing that you go with and that's why i thought it was really interesting to play a character like that because how would they react to the world and how would the world react to them and the answer is not well but that was exactly what i wanted to find out it is one of my favourite things about Roll Together, that there is absolutely no sense of, it's a boys club! Yeah, which is, oh. you know, fairly obvious when you think of the people who run it and then the core players. But absolutely love that. And well, our chat as well, the people who watch every week are generally spectacularly lovely and in no way, it's a boys club! And I love yeah. it so much. There's no gatekeeping in, mm. in this, which is really, really important. And I was definitely, when I started playing, it was a bunch of spotty teenagers who uh, couldn't talk to anybody else. Mm. And so, because this is the thing, this is what I think is interesting. There's a lot of stuff which, when it is a boys' club, is not necessarily because they don't want the girls there. It's just they can't imagine the girls being there. Because why would the girls want to be there? Because <laughs> it's great. Well, this is the thing, and this is the problem: is that um, uh, the the oh, how do you put it? It's kind of the cooties thing. Do you know that? Oh, don't touch me! I don't want you. Mm. You know. And it, but the problem is that that's. That never left me until I was probably about 18. Well, bless you. I know, which is a great shame. Did you go to a boys' school? Yes. Oh, you poor thing. That's what I mean. And so from the age of 13 to 18, just when I was supposed to be finding out about girls and understanding sort of what makes them tick, I was just wandering around with other boys in an incredibly homophobic place, which just meant that I, I was like, oh, when I went to university, I was like, oh, there's other humans here, not there are girls. Because that was the that was the thing, and that's what I mean. So exactly, it's so wonderful. That our, um, well, together, are playing RPGs without any of that kind of stuff. Because to be honest, there was no, um, and actually specifically, uh, the idea of having a romantic entanglement in D and D when it's all three of you boys and all three of you are spotty teenagers. This is not going to happen. Mm -hmm. It'd be too weird. Whereas now, I mean, <laughs> embarrassingly, I've had better relationships in D and D over the past five years potentially <laughs> than I've had in real life. Oh, cool. <laughs> Which is, you know, I think that's my fault rather than anything else. But it's really lovely when you do have good relationships in D and D. It's lovely. Yeah, for sure. We're getting very profound. Shall we roll the die before <laughs> we both start weeping? Yes, indeed. Excellent. Let's get back to the, yeah. Oh, that's much more of a Rebecca role. That is a 19. You answered question 19, so I'm going to pretend it was a 17, <laughs> which is deeply, deeply appropriate because question 17 is, how do you feel about fudging roles? <laughs> oh, okay. I, I, oh, okay. So a thing that got um, uh, put, like, uh, inculcated into me uh, when I was younger is that there is no point in cheating mm -hmm. um, uh, because um, then there's no point in playing the game. If all you're going to do is cheat, then it isn't a game anymore. It's just the thing. And so winning at all costs was never a thing for me. And um, cheating was never a thing for me because, I mean, I did cheat. You have to, to sort of find out what it's like. Hmm. But at the same time, it was never a sort of thing of like, eee, I'm cheating because that's not cool at all. Hmm. When you say fudging rolls, do you mean as in like, oh, we'll just say that it worked for the sake of doing stuff? Or do you mean genuinely like changing them 
to be better because you want them to be better? I mean, the question just says that. I guess there's two different things, aren't there? There's the DM's like rule of cool. That's or exactly what I Kindness. About. Right. And then there's a player going, I really wanted to pass this, so I didn't roll a three, I rolled a 19. Yeah, exactly. Because so those are two very different things. The rule of cool, I think, is vital to make uh, to, to making games better. To being too uh, like adhered to the rules just gets really annoying after a while and can mean the death of a campaign mm -hmm. if the players feel like they're not being allowed to spread their wings properly. Uh, the just the fudging rule that's completely unacceptable. I mean, yeah. absolutely unacceptable because it makes it completely pointless. Oping like overpowering a character is kind of fine but it's annoying it's in the same yeah. way that like i do think that you need to have somebody who's keen on the rules in a in a D, &D group because i think that it means that the dms then kept on their toes which is a good thing um but somebody who just wants to win at any cost is stupid like the you can't win at dungeons and dragons it doesn't work you're just supposed yeah. to having be having a lovely time and fudging a role goes completely against that because yeah. then you can't trust the player and then there's no point and that's really Absolutely. really annoying so, I think, oh no, sorry. What were you going to say? I was thinking you can expand that out because I think we definitely both agree on, yeah, why, why would you bother? You should just write a script. Yes. But I yes. reckon you could expand that out. I wonder what you think in terms of OP. Like, I don't enjoy playing a character who is good at everything. You need to suck at at least one thing. And I know um, Chris, his lot, encourages yeah. players in their campaigns to suck at something. Yeah. But also thinking in terms of how D&D is balanced as a game. Things mm. like, um, you know, wizards who maybe can do slightly less damage, maybe per round, but they can keep going until their spell slots run out. Versus uh, warlocks or paladins who are exceptional just, for two <laughs> rounds of yeah, combat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so you have to balance that by having the short ones where you can smite and then the yeah. longer rounds like, oh, the paladins or the warlocks a bit useless now. And then the Ooh. long form characters come into play. I love that yeah. kind of balance. That's and in my head, it's also kind of fudging if you're like, well, my character will only be powerful and cool for two rounds of combat. So we must never play more than two rounds of combat. <laughs> yes, I see what you mean. Ah, okay. Well, I think that, I think that leads into um, trying to control the game. Ah, uh, yeah, okay. Because I think that I, I think that a player who tries to control the game and be in control at all times is not going to enjoy themselves. And that's because the thing is, if you're trying to be somebody who's good at everything and never fails a role, mm -hmm. then already you're doing it wrong because again, you're trying to win and then that yeah. doesn't work. The thing is that but what, I, what you say is really interesting because what it implies is that it's kind of up to D&D &D to solve those problems, as in like with, with adjustments and rule tweaks and things like that and bringing out extra stuff, as in like, if you are a character that wants to play OP, as you say, I don't think either of us two want to do that, but it is really, really useful having them in your group occasionally. Um, yes. David uh, Frias, who, who has uh, presented this before, um, I'm playing in a campaign with him at the moment where he is a sword singer bard or something like that. Cool. But I, sorry, it's not that quite. But the thing okay. is that they're they're um, when they've got themselves set up, when they have a couple of turns to go right, I'm going to set up uh, the the sword singing and stuff like that. It means that their armor is their armor class is basically never lower than twenty seven, which is insane. <laughs> David <laughs> maxing out a character. What? <laughs> <laughs> but that's exactly what I mean. But the thing is, it is really useful because you're just watching an entire, you know, goblin horde trying to strike at this mm. character and it just no one hitting them is hilarious. Yes. And I don't think either you or I would come up with a character like that because we don't know how to, to nope. fix things like that. So that's what I mean. I think it is, um, if you've got a character, it, it, it's vitally important to be able to explore, like push the edges. Yeah. In D and D, and find out what the edges are for for a, a DM as well, because the DM then has to go ah, ah, and again keeps them on their toes, which I think is a very very good thing for a DM. But also, therefore, if you're a character, and also if you're a rules lawyer, hmm. um, which I wouldn't accuse David of being, but can edge towards that. <laughs> um, I think it's it's vital for um, again for the D and D on the uh, the DM on their toes uh, bit. It's vital for somebody to know the rules as well or better than the DM because hmm. it keeps them. Yeah, keeps them there, keeps them honest, if you feel it. Yeah, for sure. Because I think that does work well. 
Yeah, because I would hate D&D the game to mm. tweak itself so you could never play someone that OP. That would be right. upsetting. Exactly. I think it's much more to do with the DM making sure everyone has a chance to be brilliant. And if you have one character who is consistently making of everyone else at the table. I mean, I don't know. I've never had this experience because all no, my players right. and DMs are lovely. Exactly. But I can imagine if you have one player who's like, I can do everything. All of you are useless. Yeah. Then having a DM who can create a scenario where that person, nope, sorry, none of your skills work. You're tired out. Sit down. Exactly. But that's what I'm saying about. So that shouldn't necessarily be up to the DM, though. The DM should be should have the tools to be able to do that from the and because I think that because the feedback, particularly now that we've got the internet and how much feedback that allows to go back to Dungeons and Dragons and for them to make informed decisions about how the game can be made better through mm -hmm. discussion with players and DMs, obviously. But that means that there is a bigger thing, therefore, than the DM themselves, which they yeah. should be able to, to rely on. And therefore, you should be able to have any of that and also be able to sort out the problems that are created by OP characters. Because there isn't a right way to, it's as you, as you say, there isn't a right way to play. Um, the way that we play is sort of soft and fluffy and lovely, but there should also be there should also be campaigns that allow for massively OP characters. Mm, definitely. For sure. Yeah. Yeah. And also, like we were talking about, if you're talking about winning, you're doing mm. it wrong. It's yeah. about storytelling and sharing your spotlight. I wouldn't want to play in a campaign where I am the best all the time. Yeah, God, it'd be really, really boring. Really boring. <laughs> really dull. And also, in which case, why the hell have you got, I mean, can you imagine just playing a one-on-one, -on -one, just like a one-player D&D camp? Do you know, I actually did that. I think I talked that in my last interview with Niall. But really? that was with my husband, well, with my then fiance. Yes. Um, <laughs> while I was on tour for four months. Um, so we did it as a long distance way to keep us connected. So we didn't just have the like, how was your day? Fine. How was your day? Fine. Good night. That so is we played so wholesome. over wow. the phone a one on one D&D campaign. <laughs> okay, but well, yes, that's the coolest so thing with I've ever that, heard. With that caveat, I yes. wouldn't like to do it just other than yes as a long distance relationship thing well i mean then it doesn't feel like then it feels like it's more than a dnd &D thing it's mm. dnd &D allowing you to like cement your relationship that is that is really beautiful by the way i'm so yeah he's, right. he's a good yeah oh yeah keep hold of that one um absolutely I will. <laughs> <laughs> but um yeah because even thinking about it um hmm. Yes, but sorry, I was just considering back to a thing that uh, Chris and I attended. I mean, it was five years ago or something like that now, which was uh, all the different ways that um, games and entertainment and theatre can kind of interlock. Mm -hmm. And um, what that showed me was how many different ways there are, because um, one of the things in the different ways that that can interlock was the news, because the news is like the ultimate expression of completely up to date and improvisational but at the same time hide bound by rules like the way that the news is presented is very yeah. traditional but it's a complete like news news anchors have to in the most like straight and basic way improv the entire time and that's kind of amazing yeah but it's stuff like that and but also what amazes me with D, &D and part of the reason why i think it's it's exploded to the extent that it has is that there are pretty much infinite ways of playing it as you've just mm. illustrated it doesn't mean that, again like it's not the best way to play it the way that you were doing it but it enabled you to to do a to do a thing and oh it's exactly what you say the idea of that how was your day darling it was fine how was your day darling that's awful whereas what's your character going to do tonight that would be absolutely great can recommend it for anyone yeah. any dnd nerdy couples in a long distance absolutely. relationship it's a really good idea oh. Right. Um, I'm being soppy. I will roll the die again to stop me from carrying on being soppy. That was a 10. Have we had 10? We have had 10. I'm not going to fudge it because that last question made me feel guilty. I'm going to roll again. <laughs> okay. That is a natural 20. Wow. Um, it's me. I'm surprised <laughs> I haven't rolled at least five of them by now. <laughs> Nobody else celebrates how well they roll dice. This is really cool. I've got the point where I feel like I can't celebrate because it's so ridiculous by this point. I feel like I have to apologise for every net 20 instead. Amazing. I may have to get rid of all of my dice and start again just to... Just to start again. <laughs> but I can't because they're all beautiful and I love them. Okay, 20 is which character was the hardest to say goodbye to? And this doesn't actually specify whether it was your character or someone else's, so knock yourself out. Oh, the hardest to say goodbye to. <laughs> um, yeah, 
I think, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we, uh, so uh, again with Chris Lizlop, and this was ridiculously ambitious. Um, basically, um, we set up a world that we would try and get, I say we, sorry, Chris Hislop was the DM, and there were, I mean, at one stage, there must have been over 30 other players. Like, it was insane. But the idea was that it happened every Wednesday night, and whoever turned up could play. So it was very, very rare that we had anything more than 10 players, but it was a revolving cast. And the idea was that it was centered around a town, mm -hmm. um, like a Wild West town kind of thing. But that what the players said and did would inform the rest of the world. So it was a kind of like auto-generative, it wasn't just the DM doing the thing, but it was allowing all of the characters to have a, a choice in it. Mm -hmm. And um, the character who I was playing, because we had three we had three characters who represented kind of um, the good aspect of the world, the neutral aspect of the world, and the evil aspect of the world. Mm -hmm. And so the, the opening episode was amazing because the evil character um, decided to uh, like lightning bolt you know, um, what's it called? Uh, the the Emperor, what the Emperor does to uh, Luke Skywalker at the end of Return mm. of the Jedi. Um, did that to my character because this character had been found covered in blood in a um, uh, uh, in a brothel that was just full of dead prostitutes. Oh dear. Yeah, it was a really <laughs> serious like opening image. And my character was nominally the sheriff of the of the, the the wild west town and kind of the opening thing was finding this child in the brothel and who had killed all the prostitutes it was that kind of um feeling so it was a really serious opening thing but then the 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 child character laser bolted uh, laser bolted um like lightning bolted my character accusing my character of being the person who did all of this stuff mm -hmm. and because my character was uh, so good if you see what i mean they didn't say that it wasn't them. They, took, right. as it were, took on the thing of like, okay, if the if the if the town is going to decide that it was my fault, then it was my fault. It was that kind of thing. That was how logic. I, well, no, but it was. This was why it was so interesting. It was, it was so because I'd never played like a properly good character before. Mm. There, there, it had always been like chaotic good or something like that. This was a like a properly lawful good Oof. character. That's what I mean, and that was why it was so interesting to play. What the 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 oh my god! This is what I mean about having so um, because this went on for years. I think this campaign, and there was a there were a couple of characters who turned up who were trickster, uh, uh, pale elf, dark elf, um, bards, and somehow my character managed to seduce and get into a relationship with the wife of this couple. I thought you were lawful good. And this is what I mean. Ah. So the character development in this was just astonishing. Um, and not only that, but <laughs> this again is is David. Um, but basically, um, my so my character and the wife, who wasn't my wife, but referred to as wife, both got killed, but then brought back as different. Um, oh, you talked about this last time. Oh this my is God. where David with his snake popped up, right? That Absolutely. was a terrible phrasing. <laughs> wife, but it, but it was it was the thing. Of, it was one of the harshest things in the world because I was sitting there, like so. Angry is the wrong word, but so sort of with all the feels about the fact that my character was dead and I didn't know whether we were going to be revived or not, and then. David came along and found my character paralyzed for some reason and then said, if you're local, move your body, which just everybody in the entire room collapsed with laughter, except for me. It was very hard. So you were trying to grieve. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but it was the thing that what was annoying, not annoying at all, but what was um, the character did come back as a dark elf and the wife character came back as a kobold. Gosh. And so that was kind of like, I. So then it was the thing of like, they are not an attractive thing anymore. Do I still? Oh. Do I still? No, but that's okay. A kobold is reasonable. That was a sympathetic. I mean? Oh, not a oh, you right. should feel guilty. Oh, <laughs> I mean to be fair, because I do see what you mean. Like the easy, the easy 
obvious thing to do would sort of go, you're a cobble, I'm not fancying you anymore. But it feels to me like it's very, very important that love goes beyond that. Yeah, and of course. Certainly in my head, my character was definitely much more in love with, and it didn't matter what form they were in, it was just I was in love with that essence. Um, hmm. And that was the thing, because then uh, it, was only a, it was only a session or two after that that they both got killed, like, for real. Oh no, I didn't know that bit. That's what I mean, but that was the problem, is that that having got them back in this warped form, I was totally ready for them to, to go on forever and to carve out a wonderful life, but then they died. And that was, so it felt like that thing of, um, you know in a film when they kill off a character, but then the mm. character comes back at the end. I always, I'm always very uh, ambivalent about that mm. because it's lovely because it's like, oh, the character's back. And if they've done a decent job, then it's really good that the character comes back. But there's also a thing of like, you made a decision to kill that character. Yeah. And it would have been really interesting and really affecting if you'd actually let that character die. As it is, mm, there's nothing that that's it's kind of like, oh, well, of course you're going to bring it back because that's easier. And the thing was that what I had was I'd had the, the awful feeling of like, I've really lost this character. Oh, the characters come back. Oh, but they're different. Oh, I guess that means that love triumphs over all in this. Oh, no, they're dead again. Yeah. Uh, so there was nothing positive kind of left. I don't mean that Christy ended badly. It was literally, there was nothing else that could happen. I'd be, I have to be honest, the... I was just thinking as this is a sign of how well Chris DMs. Mm. Like I can, I hear sometimes people saying that playing a safe table means it's all tame and very boring and there are no feelings. But actually I think, yeah, Chris and Roll Together in general are proof of how if you make sure everyone is, there's no real world. Yeah triggers or things that will upset someone, then you can chuck yourself into the fantasy land and have all of the feelings. Yeah, 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 completely. And also if somebody like, cause um, the, the, cause I have a very, I have a, a, a very interesting, very interesting. I have a thing with this, which I, which I find interesting is that I don't like trigger warnings. I, I understand that they're very important. Sorry, let me get that. Let me make this very clear. I think they have, uh, they have a vital part in the world. I don't like them for me. Cause it feels like then I'm just expecting them. Mm. And I can see what somebody says about, like, if you're at a safe table with no trigger warnings, then it, and then it can feel tame. But only if you then, only if your characters then can't do anything, react. Yeah. Because if the characters actually get to do and say and be, like, as you say, like, uh, all of the feelings can happen, then it can be absolutely earth shattering. And nothing has to happen to them to make those feelings. It can just come from them. And that's actually more effective, I think. Yeah, for sure. But then I can understand why you would slap a trigger warning on someone who was then watching your game to be like, in case you really don't like giant spiders, we do right. improv around them for half an hour. <laughs> it's a useful, a useful tool, I think. Completely. But yes, I can see that you wouldn't want them in a way that means you must never, ever, ever go outside your tiny little box. That is completely the thing. And But also because what um, Chris talks about is stuff like torture. Like, let's not have that. There's no need. The thing is, it doesn't mean that it can't happen, but let's not have it on screen, as it were, because there's yeah. no need. It's just really unpleasant. Um, and also stuff to do with um, child abuse, stuff like that. It's why, just, why would you put that in your game? That's why? what I mean, yeah. Unless there was a very, very specific... I'm not saying that it should never, ever, ever, ever go in, but also, unless there's a really specific reason, what are we doing? Because it just seems unnecessary. And I think that's the uh, I think that's the sort of dividing line. It's not that you're ruling anything out. It's just allowing people for whom it can be really traumatic that kind of stuff to just not have to deal with it. I think that's that's completely fair and completely right. Yeah. And we were talking earlier. There's no right way to play D and D. It Absolutely. can tick so many different boxes. You can have. I mean, I have different games that do different things. I have the stupid chaotic game with no plot where we giggle for three hours and then go yeah. to bed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and then I have the games that are very. You know, we have no real world prejudices, anything yeah, like that whatsoever. Yeah, yeah, it's complete yeah. fantasy. Yeah. But then I also have a campaign where there is sexism, there are, you know, bad people and some inbuilt prejudices. But because it's played with a DM I trust implicitly and with players I trust completely, yeah. that then becomes a wonderful thing. Well, in the real world, if this happened, I would have to smile politely and try and get out of the room safely. But in this universe, I will cast a spell and make you apologize like brilliant oh lovely I, lo I do love having that space oh, being able to but actually i never thought of it like that because i thought it's like okay you can put yourself in the situation and it can be resolved well but actually as it were forcing the big bad to grovel oh 
God, that must be It great. is beautiful. And I wouldn't want it in every game I played. No, no, no. a specific group of very close friends. Yes. Um, wow. Who would never cross any lines. Knowing, yeah. I've talked about it before, it's my edgelord campaign. But um, yes. <laughs> but Go yes, ahead. knowing that these horrible things that we try not to think about in the real world, if we put them in safely in here, then we conquer them. Yes, exactly. Because it allows, yeah, 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 yeah. Because it allows you, because I was talking about putting yourself into situations which you might be scared of, and you mm. can see it might not work out well, but you can see it's not as scary. That, what you're talking about is positive affirmation. It's like, it's something that you can do where it's like, I might never be able to do this in the real world, but I can get to do it somewhere. That's yeah. vital. That's it's amazing. It's really fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, you inspired me. Thank you. Oh. I'm very inspirational. <laughs> I reckon, given our length of waffling, we have time for one more question. Okay. Do you have a particular question you are desperate for me to ask you, or shall we leave it to chance? No, just leave it to chance. I'm much keener on that. Excellent. <laughs> Ooh, uh, that is, oh, what a good question to end on. That is a 16. Okay. If you could make yourself in D&D, who and what would you be? Ah. Oh. Well, fascinatingly, my friend uh, G had a whole thing about this. There is a man who thinks outside the envelope when it comes to creating this is characters. G is in G. Sorry, Gerald. Yeah, Gerald McDermott. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. He has talked about making himself and you'd have to be quite bad because you're, you're a very, very basic human. Like, you know how humans have a plus one mm. to everything? He's like, I wouldn't take that. Yeah, because no, of course not. You'd have to pick your race as well as your class. You wouldn't ever just go with basic human. <laughs> but, but, but what I thought was interesting is that because he was talking about actually creating himself literally in a D and D oh, game. Boy, he'd be so squishy. But yeah. he would have he would have an amazing like knowledge of electronics. Yes. So, <laughs> and really good sleight of hand with all his art skills. That's what I mean. Is exactly all of that kind of stuff. So. I, I'm taking it that that's not the question, but I think I was more thinking already... of if you had to pick a race in a class, I guess. But if you want to answer the G version, then not. No, 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 no. I will let G do that when when he uh, gets a chance on here, if he does. Um, but yes, if I was okay, so I thought about this a lot, and there's a difference between like wish fulfillment and um, what uh, what you think you actually would be. Gotcha. So. Uh... Because it's there's a, there's a there's a oh, and I can't remember them off the top of my head, but there's a set of questions which you can answer, which is what kind of animal you think you are, and it's the thing of um, what you think other people see you as, and what you think you okay. see yourself as, all that kind of stuff. And the um, the one that I got for uh, what I think other people see me as was polar bear, you know, this sort of <laughs> lonesome, vicious animal who goes striding around and no one see. And then actually, the one that I see myself as was a wombat. So Take a little. If it helps, in my head, you're much closer to a wombat than a poem. <laughs> Completely. I think that is actually the thing that the people do see because that is what I am. And that's what I mean about that's why thinking about it was interesting. Because if I was uh, just going to do wish fulfillment, I would definitely be um, a, like a dark elf assassin. Do you know what I mean? Something, <laughs> like you say, something pretty edge lordy, mm -hmm. to be brutally honest. Um, something pretty like. Uh, dark and mysterious and if you come to a party like I won't talk to you but if you come and talk to me it's that kind of are you in a cape yes obviously yeah. exactly and, and all of that kind of stuff and purple eyes and all of that kind of thing I think if I was actually um yeah it will it might it would probably I'm not sure it feels like it would be a furborg or a goliath oh or actually possibly mm, what I'd really like to be, okay, I'll answer this because I really like to be. And actually, I've um, I've talked about this in uh, with uh, Chris and Emma. Um, when in the th in the campaign that was DM'd by Emma, mm -hmm. I played a character called Norodom Moniath, who was a total um, monk, but who was actually a jester. And. <laughs> And therefore, but also it was just the way that I thought about it was like, so this is really hectic, but um, uh, the so the he was taught to be a jester by his mother and father who had been enslaved by somebody who lived in a castle. And that was all he knew was the castle and being, you know, uh, doing doing um, what's it called tightrope walking, hmm. but looking as though you're going to fall off the entire time, gotcha. but never actually doing it. It's that kind of stuff. A total on a tightrope is... A vision. Do you know what I mean? Is... I love the I love this idea because I just love the idea of a turtle being really graceful and like balletic, but looking as though they had no idea what they were doing. Yeah, it's, it's that's of... amazing. But so, and then also the thing was that then when the original person who owned the castle, like that, that king, died, then his son comes to the throne, who is a bastard, 
and um, so the the, the, the Norodom then has to he just has to make them laugh and they but the problem is that in order to make them laugh he has to dance on you know hot metal and stuff like that so it's a thing it, it stops being a thing of oh this is a joyous thing making people laugh it's like I have to make people laugh otherwise it's, otherwise it's gonna hurt it's gonna hurt really really badly and therefore if there is any point where Norodom can be funny then he has to be funny and he can't stop himself and this means that it just makes the most wonderful role-playing thing because it's like oh I could do something funny there oh, guys I'm really sorry <laughs> Norodom has got to dive off the building or you know sit on the whoopee cushion or whatever whatever it is and it just made for such a wonderful sort of like oh no I could do something really effective here but he's got to do something funny <laughs> and no. that, that that feels like how I would it feels like, as it were, how I would like to be in uh, real life. Not the sort of tortured... OK, good, because I was about to get slightly concerned, but... No, 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 no. It's much more the thing of I love the idea of um, uh, viewing being funny as, like, a vocation rather mm. than uh, a, just a thing that you can occasionally do. And because then I think that once people understand what you're doing, it would be amazing. I think that's that would be the that would be what I would like to be, is a total jester. In D and D, that's exactly that is what like. spectacular, and I can see it really, really <laughs> well. Ed Cartwright, the total jester. Indeed, that's my plan. Um, if anyone watching has artistic skills, please draw me a picture of that. I want it. <laughs> me too. I Ed probably me. wants it more. To be fair, Ed, she confessed it. Um, I think that brings us to the end of our time. So, uh, before we finish, Ed, do you have anything you'd like to plug? Uh, no. Uh, well. I mean, apart from Roll Together, no, I think I'm... Yeah, I'm watch Roll Together with Grace. Yes, because it's good. It's fun. I like it. Brilliant. Well, um, thank you, Ed, very much for coming and talking to me for an hour. It was a pleasure. It was lovely. Um, and thank you, everyone watching, for joining us. Um, it was very nice of you. Mm. If you enjoyed this, um, we hope you did. We stream every Friday yes. from 6 till 7, uh, BST at the moment. And then we stream D and D games on Mondays and Tuesdays. On Mondays, six till nine PM GMT, and on Tuesdays, uh, the same time again. I think six till that nine makes sense. GMT. No. Oh, let's see if I can remember what we're doing. Oh, I can because on Mondays it's the campaign I'm in. Um, <laughs> yes. Niall is DMing uh, the Eternal Army, and on Tuesday it's your campaign, isn't it? Yes. What Cluster is it? Hmm. It is the uh, Ludia sponsored Warriors of Waterdeep campaign, uh, which is, yes, it's getting very silly, is the wrong word. Intense. Mm. It's very good. Very, well, very good. Not intense and silly? Yes, I think. I think that, which is the best way, potentially. Can confirm it is a fantastic stream. I'm not in it. Um, I am unbiased. It's great <laughs> fun to watch. Um, can recommend the Tuesday night stream. Also, the Monday. I am in that one. It's Indeed. awesome. Likewise, yes. Uh, all of our st shows stream at twitch.tv forward slash roll together RPG. And there is also a YouTube link in chat for all of our archive of shows. And don't forget, you can also find us and enjoy us as a podcast. Mm -hmm. um, lastly, many thanks again to our D20 club on Patreon, all of our sponsors and supporters. And I can't believe I have to say this, stay classy at the table. <laughs> I'd forgotten that that was a thing. Yes, stay classy at the table. <laughs> Good night. Good night. <laughs>